chapter 3. Acts in chapter 3. The book of Acts chapter 3 today. Praise God. I just hope this will help and bless and strengthen you today in the Lord. Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. Acts 8 and verse 3. Did I say it wrong the first time? My bad. You know how it is. I'm 58. <laughs> Things float around in there sometimes. Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. I want to make sure we're in the right place here. Are you all in the right place? Amen. <laughs> in my Bible, it's page 949. All right. <laughs> All right, look at verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. Verse 4, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And today I'd like to minister a little bit on the thought of the subject, uh, faith on fire, faith on fire, or we can say Seven, the seven-point ministry of the church, faith on fire, subtitling the seven-point ministry of the church. Now, those for our, our Monday night meeting we had with the teachers are going to recognize the points, but it's going to be different, okay? Let's pray today. Fathers, we come to you in the name of the Lord, thanking you, God, for the precious opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk. God, I pray that you would help us as Christians, as believers, as disciples and followers of Christ to live this life according to the word, that you would be glorified, that your church would be reignited with the power of your spirit, that we would not just go to church, but we would function as the church. I pray for that. Teach us, show us, guide us. I pray for the unction, the anointing of the Lord, for I cannot do this by myself. Thank you, Father. Anoint the ears to hear, and we just lift up the wonderful, glorious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. And you may be seated here today. God bless you. I'll, I'll try to preach as fast as I can uh, without going too fast. Amen. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord. These points that we're bringing out to you today are points that we use for our, our children's teachers meeting last Monday night. We all sat down and we discussed these points pertaining to our ministry for reaching children here at Word of Life. And I had been thinking about the upcoming meeting as to what to say for several days. But then while working on something else in my office on my computer, all of a sudden, and this is how it happens, uh, God opened up heaven. And I had to stop what I was doing and write down the points what God was telling me. For God gave me these points or these goals and the scriptures to go with them in a matter of seconds. God just bam, bam, bam. That's the way it works. But on, as I was asking the Lord and praying about this coming Sunday, uh, and I, I was asking God as to what to minister, what to preach, what Lord laid on my heart, what you'd have me say to the people. And uh, it's like, I feel like the Lord said to me, why does it have to stop here? In other words, uh, this would be good for the entire church to hear. And I pray that it'll help you in your walk with God. I pray that this will help you in your faith, uh, that you may grow, develop, and mature as a Christian and may God use you and this church to the fullest of capacity for his glory. I love the book of Acts. I love the entirety of the Bible. And uh, I, I encourage the church this coming year and the coming months just to read once again the 28 chapters uh, uh, of the book of Acts. Uh, but when you read the book of Acts, I, I see the church on the move. I see God working. I see the acts uh, of the Holy Ghost of God, the acts of Christ. Uh, but when you look at the book of Acts, what do you see? I see a church on fire. I see a church that's been saved and washed by the blood of Jesus. I see a church that believes in the power of prayer. I see a church that's full of the Holy Ghost and fire. When I look at the book of Acts, I see a church that's exploding, a church that's caught up in God. And I see a church that's bold as lions, no longer fear of the religious, but now they're proclamating the gospel. I see a church operating in the gifts of the Spirit. I see a church multiplying and growing. I see a church that will not cower or buckle under any threat. I see a church that's caught up in God and caught up in the work of the Lord. And I see a church that believes in evangelism and reaching the lost. I see a church that's healing the sick and raising the dead. I see a church that's talking in tongues as they are full of the Holy Ghost. I see a church that's praying and believing and casting out demons and saving the lost. I'm not 
so sure what you see when you look at the book of Acts. But I see a church that has a faith on fire. That's what I read. I see that. A church that has a faith on fire. I don't care what denomination you are of or what denomination you belong or believe in. But the church today should be pattering itself after the church of the book of Acts according to the word of God. Denominations are made up by man based on their different beliefs. But my friend, I can tell you, God crosses all denominational lines. The Holy Ghost of God will cross over every denominational line to touch those, to fill those with the Holy Ghost and with the fire and the power of God. And the church should be looking at the word of the Lord and pattern itself after the book of Acts. The church in the New Testament is the example of what we need to follow. Not man, not religion, not man-made denomination, but follow the word of God. Follow the Bible. Follow the instructions that have been given to us found in his word and then stick to sound biblical doctrine and teaching and do not leave it but know it and swallow it and devour it and consume it and live it out by faith in God. I don't see the New Testament church in robes and collars and liturgical attire but in our text we find a church is on fire. It's been baptized in the Holy Ghost and the flame of God has been lit upon every one of them. Saul would later be called Paul is causing havoc in the church. We see this in chapter 8 and verse 3. He's causing havoc in the church and he's going house to house and he's dragging people that are disciples and Christians and saints of God and followers of Christ and dragging them and putting them into prison and he's causing all kinds of disturbance and havoc. He's causing chaos and destruction. The religious do that, you know. They cause all kinds of problems. You know that? But Saul was religious in chapter 8. He wasn't saved. He had a knowledge of God. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. But without transformation and what a difference it makes, he wasn't born again. In Acts chapter 8, he's causing problems in the church. But then one chapter over. How many know it's not over yet? Just one chapter over. In Acts chapter 9, he's a different person. In Acts 8, Saul is religious and locking people up for preaching in the name of Jesus. But in Acts chapter 9, Saul has a life changing encounter with Jesus Christ and what we know as the Damascus Road experience. He met Jesus, hallelujah, not dead formal religion, but he met Christ. He met Jesus, who art thou? Jesus, Lord, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, hallelujah. It is hard to kick against the goads, and God had been dealing with him. No longer is he full of religious pride, but now he's saved, and he's healed. Glory to God, and he's baptized in the Holy Ghost and preaching Christ in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at Acts 9 and 20. Immediately. I like that word. We talked about that a few Sundays ago. Remember the word immediately? That's what God can do. Immediately. I love this. He, that's Paul, preached the Christ. Now, when it says the Christ, there's a definite article in front of this. It's not a mistake. This is inspired and led by the Holy Ghost of God. Remember, the Bible is God breathed. It is God inspired. There is no mistake here. Immediately, Paul, he preached the Christ, meaning this, that he is the one and only. There is no other Christ. There is no other God. There is no other Jesus. There is no other Bible. Word of the Lord. The Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. How about you? Have you met the master? Have you had a life changing encounter with Jesus? Are you born again? I pray that you are. If you're not, oh please don't leave this place without giving your heart to Christ. Please surrender to the Lord. Please give your heart to Jesus today. Are you really saved? Let me ask you this church. Are you radically saved? Do we have a radical people today? A radical on fire full of the Holy Ghost loving Jesus, hating sin, hating the devil? Uh, is there a radical people today with a radical faith on fire for God filled with the Holy Spirit of the Lord?
Lord. I pray so. This city needs a radical church. It needs a radical people. Amen. And although the church is under the heat of persecution, notice that they don't quit. Although all hell is coming against them, they don't surrender. Although Herod is trying to destroy them, they don't buckle under. But instead, they scattered everywhere. What did they do? Look at verse uh, chapter 3 and, and this at verse 4. They're preaching the word everywhere. The church is a, uh, under a persecution, but they're preaching the word everywhere. Philip goes to Samaria without an evangelistic team, and he starts preaching. Think of this. No modern methods. It's just Philip and God. It's just Philip and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's Philip and the anointing of the Lord upon his life, and people are getting saved and healed. Demons are being cast out, and there's great joy in that city because the gospel brings joy in your life. It brings joy in your heart. Peter said it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. The true gospel of Jesus Christ brings joy into your heart, brings joy into your soul. It'll change your life because God's in a life-changing business. But he brings joy. What did the church have? How were they able to impact the world around them? It, I would like to bring to your attention some points that'll help, I hope, revolutionize your life. I pray this helps. Now, there are several points. I'll only get to two of those today, okay? I ran out of paper, all right, or ran out of time, but I only got two points here today. But there's something that the church had what caused them to be able to do what they did and what the church is missing today and what the church needs to get back today, okay? Number one is this, as they had vision. The, the reason they were able to do what they did is because the church had vision. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, we need vision, amen? We need vision. That's right, vision. Look at Proverbs 29 and 18. 29 and 18 of Proverbs, where there's no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he, or he that keeps the word of God, or lives by the word by faith, that person is happy. But where there's no vision, people perish. The word, the Hebrew word for vision means this, a sight, or it means a dream. A sight or a dream. A vision is something seen in or as in a dream contributed to divine agency or given by God. Remember the dream or the vision that Joseph had from the Lord in the Old Testament and Genesis chapter 38? In the dream of the vision, they were binding sheaves in the field. Remember this? And then Joseph's sheaves stood upright and his brother's sheaves bowed down to his sheave and they didn't like that dream or vision and so they hated Joseph for it and later they threw him into a pit. They thought about killing him and then they sold him to the Midianites. There's another dream he had and in that dream the sun and the moon and the stars bowed down to him and so they didn't like that very much. The Lord was giving Joseph a little glimpse of what was coming ahead. One day he would be ruler and after much suffering and hardship and rejection Joseph was ushered to second in command in Egypt but Joseph was given a vision or a dream of what was coming ahead. See God didn't show him everything but God only showed him in part and thank God that God doesn't show us everything all at once. It would scare us half to death but God will give you glimmers of he will show you here. He will show you there. He will put the vision before you and therefore we are to trust God like Abraham and we're to leave uh, out of the uh, 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 or the Chaldees and follow God not knowing where we are going but we're trusting God. Peter had a vision from the Lord also not only Joseph but Peter. These are just a few examples in the Bible but Peter went on top of the house to pray. He was hungry and while they were fixing lunch he decided to spend some time with the Lord and so the Bible says that Peter fell into a trance or we could say a vision and he saw heaven open up and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and on the earth and so what was happening here in this vision as the Lord was revealing or showing Peter that what God calls clean don't you call unclean in other words Peter you're not living under the law now but you're living under grace Peter was so used to adhering to the law he grew up in this it was ingrained in him from a child that he was to live by the law of God and the law of Moses Moses. But now the law had been fulfilled in Christ. See, people still don't get it today. The law has been fulfilled in Christ and by Christ. And so Peter is no longer bound by the law. Church, you are no longer bound by the law. I know there are people that put the Ten Commandments in their yard and they say, You got to keep the commandments. You cannot keep the commandments. 
The commandments show us that we are weak. It shows us that we need salvation. It shows us that we fall short of the glory and perfection of God. Okay, so the only way it can be kept is by and in through Jesus Christ. And now that we're saved, we're led by the Holy Ghost. We're led by the Word. And so the Holy Spirit will lead you not to break the law. Okay, the Holy Spirit will lead you not to break the law. But in this, the Lord would use Peter to go to Cornelius' house, remember this, and to preach to the Gentiles. I guess we could say that Peter received direction or guidance from God. And so Peter preached, and those that heard right in the middle of him preaching, they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And before an altar call, they got saved, and they got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and began to speak in, mag- in tongues and magnify God. One of wonderful things happened, amen. But the word vision also means this. The word vision means revelation or oracle revelation or oracle in some bible translations they translate vision or revelation vision or revelation or we could say a word from god now the word the phrase where there is no revelation or no vision in proverbs 29 18 means where there's no word or oracle from god what happens when there's no word from God? Well, the Bible says the people perish. Or we could say the people cast off control or restraint. Or in other words, they do what they want to do rather than what God's word says. Now think about this. What about the time when Moses went up to Mount Sinai receiving the commandments from God? And he was up there quite some time, and Moses would communicate God's will to the people. God would speak to Moses. Moses would speak to the people. But when Moses was delayed 40 days, the people cast off restraint, and they did what they wanted to to do. What did they do? Well, the Bible said they built a golden calf and they worshiped it, right? Aaron says, I just threw the gold in. This thing popped up. He said, the people made me do it, right? Remember that? Pat cast the blame on somebody else. They, they ate, they drank, they rose up to play. They're, they have no longer had limits, no restrictions, no boundaries. They did what they wanted to do. A word from God gives us direction. It gives us boundaries or guidelines how to live. Now listen, when we don't spend time in prayer, we don't don't spend time in the word, when we don't come to hear the preaching of the gospel of Christ, when we have no direction from God, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to do what we want to do. Now this is happening in the pulpit and in the pew today. It's happening in the pulpit because we got a problem here. we got preachers that are not exegeting and properly preaching and teaching what the word of God says to the people. It's a free-for-all. Anybody can do what they want to do. Everybody's going to make it to heaven. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible says. We must communicate to the people what thus says the Lord, what the Bible says. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Just exegete, pull out what's there, and preach it. Okay. All right. Now, what's the result of this? What becomes, we become spiritually out of tune with God. That's what happens. When we don't have a word from the Lord, we become out of tune with God. And we can no longer discern the difference between his voice and other voices. And believe me, there are a lot of voices in the world these days that will misdirect and misguide the church. And it's happening right now. Now, I want to say something real quick here. I want you to look at uh, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1. And look at verse 6. Galatians 1. And verse 6, and uh, it says, I marvel that you are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, to another gospel, which is not another, that should be on the monitor, Brother John, but apparently maybe it didn't update, which is not, it says, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, listen to this, though we or an angel from heaven Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. What Paul is saying is what we have taught you, what we have preached to you. Let him be accursed, which means let him fall under the judgment of God and be condemned to hell. That's how serious Paul the apostle was about this doctrine of the word of God and the false teachers that were trying to pervert it and it's happening today. This is how people fall away from God. They fall into false teaching, false doctrine. They get into things that are not of the Lord, but a trick of the enemy, but a trick of the enemy, a trick of the enemy. I remember one time when I was in Bible college and I was just want to learn the Bible, I want to learn the word of God. And so, and, and so I, I, I got this thing in the mail and it sounded good. It sounded wonderful. And so they would send you uh, every two weeks, I think it was, or every month, I think it was every month or every two weeks, they would send you this, this article. You'd have to read it and study it with the Bible and then you'd have questions and a test at the end of it. You have to turn that in, they grade it and give you a grade. And so I was doing that, doing that, doing that, doing that until I came to the very end. 
And I came to the very end. I'm reading this. And I'm going, "Uh uh-oh, something doesn't sound right. And there's a check in my spirit. And I said, I don't know. There's something not right with this. I'm just learning. I'm new in the faith. But there's a check in my spirit. That's the spirit of truth. That's the Holy Ghost that's putting that check in me. He said, red light, red light, red light, red light, red light, red light. Hold it. And I began to look at this and study this thing out. And I thought, wait a minute. Who are these people? You see, they concealed who they were. They didn't want to tell me who they were. So I had to really dig and look and research. And back then, you didn't have smartphones. You didn't have Google. You didn't have any of that to look it up on the Internet. So I I just, man, I'm looking and looking and looking. And I finally, finally find out what it was. Jehovah Witness. Jehovah Witness. See, the devil was trying to get in there and get me some false doctrine, believing it was right, believing it was the truth, when really it was a cult. It was not the true preaching and teaching of the Word of God. I threw it all away. I said, Lord, thank you for keeping me from falling into that which is false and error. Oh, that's right, my friend. Mm. They get things that sometimes, you know, I mean, that's how they get people to fall away. They get into things that are not of the Lord, but a trick of the enemy. I've seen this happen over and over with people, and it leads them astray. It leads them back into law and legalism and bondage. Now, the word vision also means this, the power of anticipating that which may come to be or foresight or to envision. Foresight or to envision. Most entrepreneurs have vision. They have to have vision. Before they start a business, they can already see down the road. How many know what I'm talking about? You can already see down the road. We have some entrepreneurs here in this church, and they can already see down the road, and they have their mind what they want. They can see it, although it's not there yet. They have vision. Now, you ever heard of Colonel Sanders? You remember him? There he is right there. Oh, yeah. I'm hungry already. (laughs) And he had had failed many, many attempts before finally landing famous fried chicken. At one time, he had lost everything. He had had this hotel business or this lodge, and he had this restaurant in it, and all kinds of people would stay there, and he had all kinds of business, uh, but the place burned down to the ground, and he did not have any insurance. He lost every single cent that he had. But my friend, he had vision. He would not give up. Colonel Sanders continued on until we've got KFC today. And praise God for KFC. Hallelujah. Because of that man's vision and determination. The same thing happened to, uh, can be said for Hershey's chocolate. Mr. Hershey went bankrupt seven or eight times before finally creating his famous recipe for the Hershey's chocolate bar. But Mr. Hershey had vision and he would not give up. You see, there's the corporate vision, there's the collective vision, there's the personal vision. You see, God put a vision in my heart and in my wife's heart to move to Marion, Ohio. We didn't know anybody here. We had a word from the Lord and God gave us a vision or revelation that he was calling us to do a work for him here. He wanted us to plant a church, preach the gospel, reach the lost, pull people out of the ditch of sin and bondage so that their lives might be changed and transformed. You see, the same Jesus that saved me wants to save them. The same Jesus that delivered me wants to deliver them. The same Jesus that healed me wants to heal them. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is the answer. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, there's something the early church had. They had vision. Vision. That's what they had. The early church had vision. They had seen Jesus. They had the revelation of the cross. They had experienced the delivering power of God. They had been baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And they received the divine orders from heaven to preach the gospel, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, to teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. You see, they had a word from God. They had a vision and they could see ahead and they captivated the heart of the Lord and they went forth in a blaze spreading the gospel of the good news even under persecution and they would not let anybody stop them not Rome, not Caesar, not Herod, not the Pharisees or Sadducees no trial or hardship difficulty or persecution, no demon in hell would hold them back from fulfilling the call of God, why? Because they had vision, vision they could see ahead, they knew what God could do they had had their own life changing encounter, Jesus was their Lord he was supreme and the answer 
Only the cross of Christ can wash your sins away. They had vision. They had the mind of God. They could see what God could see. They weren't just stuck in their own little worlds. They weren't stuck in their own little lives. They lived beyond themselves because they had vision. They had captivated God. God had captivated them. They had vision. That's why. You see, they had vision of who God was, vision of what God could do, vision of how God can change the life and save the soul, vision of the kingdom of God. They had been transformed by his mighty power, and they went forth with the vision of God in one hand and the word of God in the other. They had vision, vision. And they knew God, they knew what God can do. There are no limits. Think about that, church. A church that doesn't have vision will perish. Maybe you're perishing right now. There can be people in this place right now sitting in pews that are perishing. Perishing. They're dying. They're dying out. A people that don't have a revelation or a word from God will cease to exist. They will fizzle out. They will fall away. They will disappear. They will die out. They will become complacent and disgruntled. And there are people like that in all kinds of churches everywhere. They are dis, they're, they're, they've become complacent and disgruntled. Disgruntled. And, they, and what happens, what comes out of being disgruntled is they begin to talk against you and against everybody else. And what everybody else is not doing. And they start feeling sorry for themselves. It's all about me, 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 how I feel. Now people are treating me. That's going on in the church today. The reason why the church is attacking the church is because the church doesn't have vision. Vision. So you have nothing to do, nothing to look forward to, nothing to believe in. So what do you do? You attack each other. And you gripe and you complain and you murmur about the pastor, of course. Of course, he's a, yeah, that's okay, I can take it. See, all, look at all, <laughs> who said the good target? Who said that? <laughs> Man, it's okay. It's okay. You know, I mean, anybody that takes any kind of leadership role, you're going to take it. You're going to get it. Because everybody thinks they can always run it better than that person. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Ten and a half. <laughs> What am I saying? Well, you can wear the shoes any time. I'm just saying this. The reason why the church is disgruntled and complacent and the reason why they attack each other and run each other down and feel sorry for themselves is because they lack vision. They'll become religious and self-righteous and they'll start lifting themselves up thinking they're better than everybody else because they lack vision. Without vision, it happens every time. Folks, I can see ahead. I can see, I can, I, I, instead, of, uh, instead of living for yourselves, live for God. Praise God. Uh, live for God, not for yourselves. I, I know what God can do. I can see a church on fire for the Lord. I don't know about you, but this is what I see. This is what God put in my heart years before when we came into Marion. I see a church preaching the gospel of Christ. I see a church reaching people. I see a church working and laboring for the kingdom of God. Vision. I see children coming to the Lord. I see a church teaching kids about Jesus. I see families being changed and transformed by God. I see lives changed. I see broken marriages restored. I see broken homes being mended back together again. I see the drug addict delivered and I see the prostitute made pure. Why? Because of vision. That's what God put in my heart and I'm trying to help the people of God captivate what God has put in my heart for you in this church and ministry. I see Christians growing and maturing and learning and developing and being used of God. I see Christians being Christ-like and Christ-centered, not self-centered. I see something most people don't see. I live it. I see it. It takes vision. Do you have vision? Do you see it? The church today needs vision. Vision. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. But happy are those who live by the word of God who keep the law of God. They obey the Lord. Their lives line up with God's word. And they're not just hearers of the word, but they are doers of the word. <laughs> they have vision. Do you know there's a guy one time that accused this church of being not being doers of the church, doers of the word. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? 
<laughs> we have hard working, laboring people that wear multiple hats that work for the kingdom of God and gives God the glory. And I am thankful for them and I'm blessed by them. Praise God. Okay, so what's it going to take to be a faith on fire like this? Well, you got to have vision and you got to keep the vision before you at all times. I do this because God put this in my heart because the devil will try to stifle it out. He'll try to cause you to lose your vision. And when you lose your vision, you become disgruntled in your work and you get mad and upset because everybody else is not helping you. How do you know that, Pastor? Because that's happened to me. That's happened to me. And, and so what happened there is I lost my vision but I had to get it back and say, you know what? Regardless if anybody helps or not, I do this for the Lord and for souls to be saved. Glory to God. Vision that God has put in my heart to reach the least, the last, and the lost for the glory of God. But it takes vision. If word of life is going to continue here, here in 2023 and doing what the Lord wants it to do, we must have a people that are caught up in Jesus that have vision from God, from the Lord. Amen? All right. Not only do you have to have vision, but number two, there's, there's the call. There's the call. This is the second point, uh, the seven points I can get to today. Okay, the call. Matthew 22 and 14 says, for many are called, but few are chosen. It's important for you to know that you've been called by God. That's right, church. You, you have been called by God. Every one of us are called. God called you. See, the word church in the Greek is ekklesia. Ek, ek, ek means out or from. Let's see it, kaleo. Kaleo in the Greek is call or to call. And so you have, you have ekklesia. Out of, to call out of. And so in the Greek, it means, uh, church means called out ones. We're called out. You see, we've been called by God. We're chosen by God. The Lord reached out to you and he called you. Now listen to this. You didn't find God. He found you. He found you. Now, now I know we got to be careful because you have this reformed theology today that is not good. That believes that only God calls a certain amount of people to be saved. That's not true. God desires for all to be saved. They don't believe in the rapture. That's right. They don't believe in the rapture. They don't believe that you can lose your way. They don't believe, they believe that God has called a certain people to be saved. That's not wrong. That's not right. That's damnable. That's heresy. Okay? Sorry. I feel that. And so, you didn't find God. He found you. You responded to the call. You were saved. You're washed. You're redeemed. You're sanctified. He called you out of the kingdom of heaven. And placed in the kingdom of light, didn't he? Look at Peter said this. But you are a chosen generation. Called. Chosen generation. Called. Called. Turn to somebody and say, you're called. You're called. You're called by God. Chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Priesthood. Ministry. Ministry. There you go. A holy nation. Walking in holiness. Come out from among them and be holy. Be separate, says the Lord. Be, walk holy. Be holy as I am holy. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus tells us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Strive for perfection. Live holy. You represent the kingdom of God. You represent the Lord. His own special people. Turn to somebody and say, you're special. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you're special. You're some kind of special. <laughs> That's right. Oh, boy, are you special. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, yeah, you're special, all right. All right. All right. All right. God, God, God chose you. God called you. Called you. You're his priesthood. You're holy. Three things right there. Called, ministry, holy, his own special people. Now listen to this. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called you out to live for him. He called you out to serve the Lord and to serve others. Not only has God called you, but not only has God saved you, not only have you been taken out of darkness and placed in light, but God has also chosen you for his great work. In other words, he's called every one of us into ministry. Look at, when I say ministry, I mean serving, serving. That's right, ministry, serving. We serve God, we serve one another. We serve God, we serve one another. Because my relationship is right with God, my relationship can be right with others. Because I'm right with God, I can serve you. And Jesus said, take it this far, even love your enemies. We do this with a humble and loving heart. Now, the attitude, now let's talk about the attitude. We do this with a loving and humble heart. I don't do this to get a pat on the back. I don't do this to get a thank you, although you do say thank you, and I appreciate that. But whether you say thank you or not, listen, I do it unto God. And I appreciate your, your gratitude, and I, I, I'm very, very appreciative for your thankfulness. But, 
But we have to do this with a heart of servitude, a servant's heart. Our heart should say, I want to serve. I want to help. I want to be used of God. I delight in the work of the Lord. Remember now, you've got vision. You might say, well, pastor, you know, I'm not called into full-time ministry. I realize that. Not not everyone is called into full-time ministry, yet we are all full-time ministers. Jesus said, did you not know that I must be about my, what, father's business? The Christian, you, the disciple, the follower of Christ, should be about doing the father's business, doing the will of God, fulfilling God's will, not our will. You see, it should be in our praying. We should say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are called of God. We're called into the ministry of reconciliation. We are called to reach the lost. We're called to preach the gospel. We are called to take care of the matters within the church. Oh, it's not just the pastor's responsibility. Did you know that? But members of the church to take care of the responsibilities of the church. You know, you know hold it now. Wait. But, but pastor, you started that church. I just did what God told me to do, but I don't own the church. I am not an owner of anything in the church. I have personal property of my books and my bookcases in there. But that computer and that desk and that chair and all that's in there belongs to the church. Did you know that? Hey, by the way, thank you for letting me borrow it. <laughs> I can just hear the church now, Pastor. That doesn't belong to you. Get out. <laughs> all right. Now realize this. Now, so so what's happened is, is we have we have started a church and people have been saved and people have come to this church and so we're growing we're maturing we're developing okay and when a baby like little baby Rhett he's just a baby so he can't do anything you know Michael's not going to say hey Rhett here's the keys of the car go ahead and take a ride he's not going to do that why because he's not ready for that yet it takes time and he'll grow and he'll mature and he'll develop, right? And so he'll get to a, he'll finally he'll get to learn how to crawl and then he'll get to learn how to stand up and then he'll get to learn how to walk and then he'll run it. Boy, then, then you're in trouble. <laughs> he'll run, he's going everywhere. He's a toddler, man. He's taking off. And then he'll learn how to ride a bicycle. And then he'll learn how to drive a car eventually when he's of age, when he's mature. Well, church, let me just say this. Word of life has gone past the infant stage. We've gone past the toddler stage. We've gone past the bicycle stage. We've gotten to the place where we can drive a car. And now you can take the responsibility to take care of the affairs of the church. There was a time here at Word of Life where nobody wanted to do anything unless the pastor was there. And some of you, you had you squawked a little bit about that. Why isn't the pastor here? What's he doing? Well, he's home preparing for Sunday. Wow. He doesn't need to do that. Really? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. Next time I prepare a meal, and I don't have the time to cook it, but I'll just slap it on the plate and give it to you. And you eat raw hamburger and raw potatoes. And green beans that are cold, that's not too good, is it? Okay, what am I trying to say? See, God is trying to help us here. Now, now listen to this. It's not just the pastor's responsibility, but the members of the church. Peter said, I, 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 I'm, I'll be done a, few, a little bit, okay? <laughs> Don't call the taxi yet, but just hold on. Peter said, therefore, brethren, remember this? Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. All right, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. You see how important this is? Whom we may appoint over the business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Okay, let's look at this for a second here. People within the church that were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, those who had a good reputation, they had to be godly, faithful, trustworthy, committed. They would take care of the affairs and responsibilities of the church. The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews. And they were saying, hey, we got a lot of problems over here, and we don't know what to do. Nobody's helping us. And so they, they got deacons of the church. Now, now, let's understand. Why would they take care of the responsibilities of the church? Why? So the minister or the elder or the pastor could spend time with God in prayer and in the word preparing to feed the flock. Now, if you have a low value of the Bible, that's not important to you. But if you have a high value of what thus says the Lord, if you have a high value of the word of God, then that will be important to you. Okay? All right, hold on. So that he can be filled with the Holy Ghost and have a fresh word from heaven to minister to your hearts. So that he's not tired, worn out, but renewed and refreshed in God. A pastor never wants to be, never wants to just throw something together. 
He never wants to do that. He Listen, he wants to be prepared. As 2 Timothy 2 and 15, study to show yourself approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That, that the word of God, the word of God would minister unto your hearts. You see, deacons, listen to this. I, I know this is crazy, but here it goes. Deacons don't run the church. They don't run the pastor. They serve to take care of the duties and responsibilities of the church. A lot of churches have this all wrong today. The deacons control rather than serve. The deacon, and the word deacon in Greek, okay, is a diak. Diakonos, diakonos, and it means this, servant. The word deacon means servant, servant. A deacon must be or have a servant's heart or attitude. They must be willing to help others, willing to sacrifice themselves and their time. They serve under the leadership of the pastor or the elder, helping them in the practical matters of the church. They are to assist by overseeing the needs and the affairs of the church. What about a deacon? Deacon means to serve. They're servants. They must have a genuine relationship with God. you got to be saved. you got to be born again. Deacon or deaconess. I'm okay with deaconess here in the church. They must not be a, a, a novice or novice, a beginner in the faith. they got to be mature. You can't put somebody that's not mature in that position. they got to be faithful. How about that? Faithfulness. Faithfulness in the house of the Lord. Trustworthy. And they have to be like-minded and have the mind of God and carry and share the same vision that God has placed in the pastor's heart. They're going to be rooted and grounded in the Bible. Must be Christ-centered, not self-centered. You know what else? They're going to be teachable and humble before God and reverent. Very important that they're reverent. And not double-tongued, not gossipers, you see. Because what happens in human nature is that... Um, there are people that'll, that'll go to somebody in the church and they'll say, well, you know, what do you think of this and what do you think of that? Well, the pastor says this and yada, 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 what do you say? And they try to get us to turn against each other. Double-tongued, not gossips. Do you know that a deacon's wife or a person that could be a deacon, the wife could even disqualify them because they're gossips? Do you know that? Mm-hmm. Not given alcohol, not greedy, not, but you must be tested. And another thing is, I know we're living in this day and age, but I, I know people get all upset about this, but just throw it out there because it's in the Bible. Dress modestly in a way that glorifies God. All right? Now, I want to say something. This is the house of the Lord and the house of worship. It's not a factory. It's not a factory. Okay? Amen? We've come to glorify God. We're not in a factory we are in the house of the Lord, gathered together, saints of God, and this is holy ground because the Lord is present. We're two or three gathered together. There he is in the midst of them. I know there's a lot of people that'll, that'll, that'll be upset about that, that don't like that, that don't agree with that. That's okay. You're welcome to your own opinion. But God has called many, but not many, very many are willing to, to take the time or the responsibility to serve. Listen to this. About 10% of the church carries the rest of the church. 10%, 10 out of every 100. About 3% of the church tithes faithfully. 3% tithe faithfully. It's more than that at Word Life, and I thank God for that. See, God gives us the opportunity, but are we? T but so many times we're too occupied with our own affairs. Like with Israel, God's house was in dire need of repair. It was in ruin, but their houses were nice. They took care of themselves, but not the things of God. They were living good, but not God. Their places were better than God's place. Their priorities were discombobulated. Jesus said in, to his disciples here, he said, the harvest... Truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest, his harvest. Jesus is saying that there's a lot to do. There's a lot of work. There are many souls to reach. Harvest speaks of a time when the crop is ready. The crop is ready. You look out there and the harvest, the crop is ready. It's ready for harvesting. It's ready to gather in. But if the farmer does not have any, enough help, then the crop will perish. If he doesn't have enough help to get the crop in on time, it will be lost forever, ever. Harvest souls. Souls. Folks, let me just say this. There are a lot of souls out in the world that are ready for harvesting. I feel the urgency in my spirit. I feel it. Jesus is coming and time is running out. There's so much work to be done. I'd rather wear out for Jesus than wear out for the temporary things of this life. I'd rather wear out for Jesus. 
Why not wear out for Jesus? I'd rather give everything I have for Christ. See, we have a high calling. The calling's from God. He's called us for such a time as this. He's called Word of Life for such a time as this. Think about this. It's, it's, it's unique. It's special. It's amazing what God is doing. He's called us to labor for his kingdom. He's called us to work in the ministry. He's called the church to be the church. He has called us to serve. There should be no vacant spots left. All ministry positions should be filled with the right people. Every joint supplies. Everyone has a part. Everyone. Faith on Fire is a church that has vision. Vision. They must have vision, and that vision must be always before them. They have the call. They have the call. They know the call, and they're willing to give of themselves to God. There's, there's more to say on this, but, but I'll have to leave, leave that till another day. But, but I noticed that in the New Testament church, it was dynamic church. Notice that. It was a dynamic church. God used ordinary men and women. Some were fishermen. Some were tax collectors. Some were doctors and lawyers. Some were housewives and carpenters. But God used all kinds of ordinary people, called them, saved them, put a vision in their heart, and then he used them. To turn the known world upside down. Wow. Glory. I mean, think about this. They knew that they could die for their faith. Be crucified on a cross or a tree. I wonder today in the church, if we would gather together knowing that we could be killed. Would we serve the Lord knowing that our lives could be taken in America? Would we? This early church, they had the fire of God. Faith on fire. My Lord, God wants to use them, and he did use them, and God wants to do the same with you right now. God wants to do with the same with you right now. Church, uh, oh, Lord, you know, we, we have all our modern conveniences here in America. And, and sometimes that can be not a blessing. <laughs> it causes us to be soft and cozy, complacent, lackadaisical. Oh, but friend, faith on fire. This is what faith on fire does. What's it going to take for us to see it, to get it, to understand it, to live it, to do it? I'm yours, Lord. I'm willing. That is the church. Wow. Wow. My Lord. Let me read this. I've read this before. We read this last Monday night. I know it pertains to children's ministry, but I, I feel like this really helps us. I'm a minister. I'm a minister to the largest mission field in the world. I minister to children. My calling is sure. My challenge is big. My vision is clear. My desire is strong. My influence is eternal. My impact is critical. My values are solid. My faith is tough. My mission is urgent. My purpose is unmistakable. My direction is forward. My heart is genuine. My strength is supernatural. My reward is promised, and my God is real. In a world of cynicism, I offer hope. In a world of confusion, I offer truth. In a world of immorality, I offer values. In a world of neglect, I offer attention. In a world of abuse, I offer safety. In a world of ridicule, I offer affirmation. In a world of division, I offer reconciliation. In a world of bitterness, I offer forgiveness. In a world of sin, I offer salvation. In a world of hate, I offer God's love. I refuse to be dismayed, disengaged, disgruntled, discouraged, distracted. Neither will I look back, stand back, fall back, go back, or sit back. I do not need applause, flattery, adulation, prestige, stature, veneration. I do not have time for business as usual, mediocre standards, small thinking, outdated methods, normal expectations, average results, ordinary ideas, petty disputes, or low vision. I will not give up, give in, bail out, lie down, turn over, quit or surrender. I will pray when things look bad. I will pray when things look good. I will move forward when others stand still. I will trust God when obstacles arise. I will work when the task is overwhelming. I will get up when I fall down. My calling is to reach boys and girls for God. Or we could say everybody for Jesus. It is too serious to be taken lightly. Too urgent to be postponed. Too vital to be ignored. Too relevant, relevant to be overlooked too significant to be trivialized, too eternal to be fleeting, and too passionate to be quenched. I know my mission. I know my challenge. I know my limitation, my weaknesses, my fears, and my problems. 
and I know my God. Let others get the praise. Let the church get the blessing. But let God get the glory. I am a minister. I minister to children. This is who I am. This is what I do. Glory. If we can take that and adapt that into our hearts and our lives and to the church, do you know what God can do with you? Church, do you have vision? The church needs vision. It needs vision. Oh, God, give us vision. Vision according to your word. Vision that will help us to reach the lost. Vision that will cause us to be faithful to the Lord. Vision that will allow us to sacrifice of ourselves. Vision that will bring commitment and faithfulness. Vision. Oh, God. We have been called of the Lord. We belong to God. We are children of Christ. We're in the family of the Lord. We are priests unto God. It's more than just your life. You're living your life for him because you belong to him. So we work together, labor together, pray together. We help each other. We serve each other. We're servants and we serve. And we're willing to take the towel and wash the feet. We're willing to do whatever it takes. Because I am a child of God. And we're working together to advance his kingdom. And there's a harvest out there. And if we don't get that crop in on time, and if we don't hurry, we're going to lose it forever. Doesn't it ever disturb you? That we can lose the crop forever, the souls forever. God, help us. Can we stand together today? Oh, God. Oh, Lord God, my Lord. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, help us. My Lord, put the vision in our hearts. My God, let us feel the burden of the Lord. Let us have a desire to see the lost saved. Lord God, I pray in the name of the Lord. God, give us vision. Give us vision. Vision that comes from the Bible. Vision that comes from God. Lord, I pray in the name of the Lord. God, put it in my heart. Put it in my heart. Put it in my heart. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Can you praise Him? Can you worship Him? In the name of the Lord, Jesus. I want to feel the burden of God. I want to see what God sees. Oh, Lord. God, I want to reach the lost. I want to be used of the Lord. I'm willing, God. I'm willing. I'm willing, Lord. Praise God. How many here would say, Pastor, I'm willing to give it all to Christ. My life, I'm willing to give it all to God. Anybody in this house? Just raise your hand. I'm willing, Lord. I'm willing. I'm willing. I give it all. My life, I hold nothing back. I give it all to Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want vision, Lord. Put it in my heart. Praise God. Put it in my heart, God. Let me never forget. I'm called of God. and I belong to the Lord. Can I just ask this church to come and find a place to pray for a few minutes today? And maybe you can cry out to the Lord and say, God, I want that vision in my heart. I don't want to lose it. Help me to live it. Help me to know it. Help me, God, to be one that takes the bull by the horn, so to speak, and I will do what God has called me to do. I'll rise up and be the man of God and the woman of God. Hallelujah. I'll take the towel. I want to serve. I want to serve. I want to love you, Lord, with all my heart. I want to love you. I want to serve you, my Lord. Oh, God, put that vision in our hearts in this church. My Lord, put it in us. Put it in word of life. May it be revived and renewed. God, I pray. Jesus, 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 God, my Lord, cry out to him. 
Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. The early church had vision. And they turned the known world upside down. Without vision, my people will perish. They will fizzle out. They won't understand what it's all about. They won't get it. They'll never get it until they surrender and God gives it to them. Hallelujah. My Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord. My God and my God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Do it, God. Do it. Put it in our hearts, Lord, I pray. Oh, Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let the church arise. My Lord, I pray. Put it in our hearts. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Put it in our hearts, God. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Glory to God. In our hearts, Lord. Put it in us. God, you do the work, I pray. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. My Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do this, Lord God. Hallelujah. Do this, Lord. Hallelujah. I've got something to live for. God put it in my heart. I'm serving Him. I'm living for Him. Fulfilling His call and His purpose in my life. See, God gives us hope. God gives us purpose. We have a reason for the existence in our lives. And that is to serve the Lord and to serve others and to glorify the Lord and to reap the harvest in the name of Jesus. My Lord, in the name of Jesus. My Lord, we praise you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Put it in our hearts, Lord. Hallelujah. Put it in us, God, I pray. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Hallelujah. Burn it in me, God. I pray in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, my life belongs to you. I will serve you all the days of my life. And I will bring you glory. And by the help and the grace of God, I fulfill the purpose of the Lord in my life. I'm willing, Lord. I'll serve you. I'll serve others. Lord, I'll humble myself. I'll humble myself. I'll take the towel. And I'll wash their feet. Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. Every joint supplies the church working together as one in Christ. That's what God designed for the church. That there needs to be unity and harmony in the church. On the day of Pentecost, they're in one place and one accord. There, were, there was unity in their heart and their soul and their mind and their spirit. Hallelujah. Division weakens. The devil divides and it weakens. But God desires that we protect the unity of the Spirit and the bond of truth. Praise God. Praise the Lord. God, I pray that we'll have a faith on fire, a radical faith, a faith on fire for you, a radical faith in Christ, a radical faith in the Lord. Let our light shine, ministering, teaching, preaching the gospel of Christ, winning the lost to you, being used of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. It is for such a time as this. This is where God has placed us. I'm just trying to follow the will of God, the Lord. Praise Him. Praise Him. Jesus, O oh Lord. My Lord, Jesus, Almighty God, Almighty God, Almighty God, Almighty God. I promise you that if we will come together in unity, 
and in one accord with the vision that God has placed in our hearts, nothing will be able to stop it or destroy it. Hallelujah. We're building the kingdom of God. We're reaching the lost souls for Christ. That we must know. For a church that no longer is reaching souls for Jesus ceases to exist as the church of the living God. God is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. All to be saved, delivered. Glory. Oh Lord, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And da ba 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 shakala la ba 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 shuku. La ba 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 shuku kaya ba 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 ta ra ba ko kaya ba 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 ba. La ba 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 ta ra ko kaya ba 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 shuku kaya ba 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 ta ra. And da ba 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 shuku la la ba 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 ba. Your touch, Lord, your presence, your spirit. Jesus, Jesus. In the name of the Lord, we praise you. We give our all to you, God. God, let that vision burn in our heart that's according to your word. Jesus, place it there. Oh, Father, I pray in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh God, may you bring revival to Word of Life. Bring you bring revival to the people here. Lord, may we have a fresh encounter of Jesus. May heaven open up. And may God you pour out your spirit, the former and the latter rain. May we be hungry. May we be willing to receive. May we have a faith on fire. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. Oh Lord, the one that can save, the one that can deliver, the one that can set the captive free. My Lord, Jesus, God, my Lord, I give you praise, I give you glory. We lift up the name of the Lord. Do something wonderful here, miraculous here, in our hearts, in our midst. Oh Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, my Lord. Hallelujah. My Lord. Brother Larry, you just sit right there, okay? But I'm going to ask the men of the church, if you'll gather around Brother Larry, just lay hands on him, and we're going to pray for him. Men, pray for our brother back here. Pray. Hallelujah. Just gather around him. Praise the Lord. He's a walking miracle. I'm telling you, he's a walking miracle. My Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, praise God. Lord, we gather around our brother here this morning, God. And we thank you, God, for keeping him. We thank you for helping him. We thank you for the miracles in his life. God, I know, I know it 
It's day by day. I know the struggles, the hardships, the, the darkness sometimes, and the depression that we fight against. But God, I thank you, God. And I pray right now, I, I lift Brother Larry up to you in the name of Jesus. And the men of the church, we pray, God, that you'd pour out from heaven. And I pray that you'd renew his heart, his mind, and his soul, and his spirit. In the name of the Lord, I pray for a refreshing and a renewing and a reviving and a strengthen that comes from God. I pray for the Spirit of the Lord to infiltrate into his soul. And I pray that hope would come. And I pray, Father God, that you would touch him by the power of your spirit, that virtue would flow from heaven. And we pray for a miracle of healing, a miracle of healing, that the Lord would touch and minister, oh God. And we ask you, Father, Jesus, that by your stripes we are healed. And so we stand upon it and we take it and we receive it and we absorb it and we apply it. God, I pray, overshadow him with your presence and with your glory. Help him, Lord, I pray. Almighty God, Lord, he needs you. We need this, Lord, and we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray for others, Lord. We pray for Miss Rhonda that's having surgery tomorrow. We pray for her for success in this surgery. We pray, Father God, for Sister Sue. Pray that she will get better and healthy. Your hand and touch upon her and healing. We pray for Sister Ida. Lord, that you would touch her. God, heal her of cancer. Bring healing into her body. In the name of Jesus, we speak and take authority over every rebellious cancer cell in the name of Jesus. And she is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray for her. My Lord, we lift up Brother Jim to you. God, we pray. He needs a miracle, Lord. He needs a miracle, Lord Jesus. And you know this. God, we will come to you. We will pray. We will believe that you're going to restore that kidney. Lord, let a miracle take place and the kidney begin to function in the name of Jesus. Speak life into that kidney. Lord, we speak life in that kidney. In Jesus' name. Lord, you are our physician and healer. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. I thank you that Morgan's doing better. We give you all the glory. We pray for Sister Mary and her coming up surgery. We pray for great success and healing. For you are God that's in control. We believe, we believe in the power of prayer. Lord, I'm asking your hand to be upon her. Lord, others that you know, but God, we also pray for the lost. Church, you know lost people. You have maybe someone, a child, a son, or a daughter, a grandson, granddaughter, great-grandson, great-granddaughter. They're not serving God. They're running from the Lord. They're not living for God. There are some people right now that they're just struggling in their faith. The devil is knocking them around. Pray for them. We'll lift them up before the Lord. God, we pray for the harvest. Use us. Use us. Use us. Use us to reach you. God, we pray for the lost. We pray for their soul. We pray for the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter. We pray for the backslider that's gone the other direction, that is running from the Lord and the influence of God, running from truth, running from the grace of God, running from you, Lord. Save them, draw them, convict them, bring them back. Let the light pierce the darkness in this city. We pray against strongholds and bondages. We pray against the powers of darkness that tries to hold back and hinder the church from functioning. We pray in the name of the Lord. God, we pray for those that the devil is just fighting them in their mind. We pray for them, Lord, that you would give them soundness of mind and that they would know the truth. Live by that and not by the lie. God, bring unity in this church. 
I'm asking God that you bring a oneness in this place. Lord, this message can be preached at any church, any place, any time. It doesn't apply just to this church, but although it applies to this church. Lord, let us work together with the right heart and attitude in humility and love, serving each other, serving each other, caring about each other. We serve each other. Praise God. I extend the hand of love. I extend the hand of gratitude to my brother, to my sister. I'm willing to serve the Lord. And I'm pliable, flexible. <laughs> Sometimes people say, well, you know, this is the only ministry I do. This is the only thing I do. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But God, what if God wants to broaden your borders? And say, well, I want to use you here too. Or I want to use you to do this. I want to use you to vacuum the floors. Thank you, Sister Jan and Sister Robin. Yesterday they came. Cadence. They came to help. I, I might want to use you to clean bathrooms. I might want to use you to cut the grass. I might want to use you to paint. I, want, I might want to use you to teach or to sing. I, I might want to use you... I'm telling you, say yes before you've been asked. Yes, Lord, I'm willing. Amen. Praise God. And uh, the more time the pastor or elder or minister is able to spend in, in the word and in prayer, the better it'll be for the congregation, the better it'll be. Well, this is part one. <laughs> I got some, several other points, and we'll see how the Lord leads me on this. But I've really been wanting to say this really for a long time. I just didn't know how to do it. But the Lord does it, doesn't he? Amen. Let's, let's stand together today and praise God. We serve each other. We serve each other. Hallelujah. You belong to God. We're not above each other. You're not, we're not better than anybody else. I'm not above you. <laughs> You're not above me. You're not above others. We're, we're, God is no respecter of persons. We're, we're saints. We're Christians. We're disciples. We're, we're servants of God. Amen. And as servants of God, we're going to extend the hand of love and fellowship. And so would you do that now? Would you... Say, I'm willing to be a servant. I, I just go to the people in this congregation and extend your hand of love and fellowship and just say, I love you. I appreciate you. Yeah, that's okay. You're a servant of God. Go ahead. I love you. Let's go around. I love you. I appreciate you so much. I love you. I appreciate you. You're so precious. Go ahead. Because we, we want that. We need that. We need that. For God has created that. Be a servant first. Step out of your pew and say, I love you. I appreciate you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Service tonight at 630. Service, come on back tonight. 6.30, let's have church. Let's worship the Lord. Let's have a time in His presence and in fellowship. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. May this bless you, help you, encourage you, and strengthen you. 6.30 tonight, church. Amen.